Hello, legends and super legends. Eldred here. It's story time with Velo Harmony. Today I want to talk about one of the greatest time trialers in the history of cycling, Jacques Anquetil. Jacques Anquetil, the sight of Jacques Anquetil on a bicycle gives credence to an idea that we Americans find unpalatable, that of a natural aristocracy. From the day he seriously straddled a top tube, Ankh had a sense of perfection most riders spend a lifetime searching for. Between 1950, when he first rode his first race, and 19 years later when he retired, Anquetil had countless frames underneath him, yet that indefinable poise was always there. The look was that of a greyhound. His arms and legs were extended more than was customary in his era of pounded post-World War II roads, and the toes pointed down. Just a few years before, riders had prouded their ankling motion, but Jacques was the first of the big gear school. His smooth power dictated his entire approach to the sport, hands resting serenely on his thin mafak brake levers, the sensation from Quincampoix, Normandy, appeared to cruise while others wriggled in desperate attempts to keep up. At the normally tender age of 19 in 1953, Jacques plunged into the professional side of the sport, convinced that his daring move would be more financially rewarding than strawberry picking. He wasn't wrong. His first major race in the colors of La Perle bicycles was the Grand Prix des Nations, the most famous and difficult of all time trials. At 140 kilometers, it was nearly twice the distance of the current version. Undaunted, Ankh led from start to finish. The legend had begun. That legend came to be composed mostly of magnificent solo rides against the clock and tour victories. Just as significantly, but with two exceptions, there were no great one road race classic wins on that list. Jacques never concealed his disdain for road races. He feared the danger of rubbing elbows in the pelotons and the explosive jumps of his rivals. It was all so well plebeian. <laughs> plebeian means common, for those of you who are not familiar with that word. His natural self-assurance would have indicated a birth at Versailles two centuries earlier. Just after Jacques first win in the nations, Louis Bobet, the top French star of the day, came over to congratulate him. A great ride, I am pleased to meet you, Bobet said as he extended his hand. But we already know each other, Anquetil responded. I beat you in a pursuit race last Sunday. Onlookers choked, but the two grands understood. Anquetil had meant no offense, and Bobet took none. In November, the Normand drove down to Italy for the Trofeo Baracchi race. En route, he visited the most famous rider of that era, Fausto Coppi, Championissimo. Coppi was more than hospitable. He revealed his entire approach, which emphasized a rigorous discipline. Fausto concluded their meeting by inviting Anquetil to live with him so they could train together. Who wouldn't have been blown away by such an invitation? Anquetil was certainly touched, but making his excuses, he left. Even as he walked to the car, he mused, I know I have to go to the front alone. In a career that included victories in all three major tours, five Tour de France, two Tour of Italy, one Tour of Spain, nine Grand Prix de Nations, the hour record twice, 11 years apart, 
and almost countless other events, it's difficult to choose among the great moments. For much of his career, he won tours in a quiet way that the public did not appreciate. For weeks, he could stay close to his enemies and then attack in a time trial. His method of just enough didn't appease those who craved bold moves. When Anquetil was his most dominant, leading the 1961 Tour de France, from first day to last, he was accused of being the rider whom no one could drop, but who could drop no one. The tour organizers, ever sensitive to criticism, progressively reduced the time trials and piled on the mountains. By 1963, Jacques knew he'd have to alter his plans. After the Pyrenees and two time trials, Jacques trailed the great Spanish climber Federico Bahamantes, the Eagle of Toledo. With the Alps yet to come, Ankitil's worried about their man. The Ankitil fans, Ankitilis, they were called Ankitilis. Ankitilis worried about their man. The biggest alpine stage into Chamonix featured a new climb, the steep rocket Col de Foucault. This came after two other first category monsters. Ankh and Baja, Baja Montes, the Eagle of Toledo, mounted the gears 42 in the front and 26 in the rear, gears normally seen on tourist bicycles because of the steepness of the climbs to come. When the Eagle of Toledo made his expected attack, only one man could hold him. It was the new Jacques Anquetil. Riding as he knew he must, Jacques was so in control that he didn't attempt to respond to every acceleration by the Spaniard. Instead, Anc maintained a steady rhythm that pulled Bahamante's back as surely as a fish on a line. He ground him down. At the summit, Akintil was actually setting the pace. He knew he had the stage, the race, in the bag. He also had a new popularity. Just one little problem. He had made the climb on his light time trial bike, which was considered too fragile for the wild gravel-strewn descent. But tour rules did not allow a bike change for any reason other than a mechanical breakdown. Ankatil's crafty manager, Rafael Geminiani, had a solution. With the top in sight, Jacques gave Jim the eye. Jacques yelled, My dear Elia! Shit! <laughs> responded Geminiani, loud enough for a passing race official to hear. He's broken his dear Elia! The mechanic le leapt from the car, spare bike in hand. As he handed the new bike to Jacques, the mechanic produced a pair of wire cutters and snipped the cable on the side away from the judge. The judge saw nothing and Anquetil was pushed on his way. A perfect example of tour founder Henri de Grange's motto for success. Tête et jambe, head and legs. From that day, Ankatil paired with Geminiani, went on to ever more creative wins. In 1964, he became the only rider other than Fausto Coppi to win the Giro d'Italia and the Tour de France in the same year. In 1965, he won the Dauphiné Libéré, a tough week-long stage race. Jetted across France the same evening, of the last day, he slept for four hours, then pedaled off into the 4 a.m. darkness and rain of the 365-mile-long Bordeaux-Paris race. You have to ask? Anquetil won, of course. Jacques rode his last major tour in 1967. It was the Giro d'Italia, and he only finished in third, victim of the hot young Italian Felice Gimondi. Down in seventh place was another star of the new generation, Eddie Merckx, the cannibal. Merckx and Anquetil each was the master of a generation. Merckx, of course, tried to win everything all the time. 
That was hardly Jacques' mentality. One quality they did share was the ability to suffer on their rare off days. It's easy to win when you feel great and everyone has a complex about your strength. But to persevere when the myth is shattered, when the champion is exposed as mortal, after all, then a real measure of the man is possible. Ankitil had a particularly low point at the end of 1962. His training had tapered off after the tour, and by the end of October, he was far from his best form. But the contract for the Trofeo Baraki had been signed. There was no ducking the obligation. The Trofeo is a two-man time trial, and in eight attempts, Jack had never won it. Something about the change in tempo while alternating the lead was unsettling to him. His partner was Rudy Altig, the German champion, a formidable rider from Germany. For example, Altig beat Eddie Merckx in the opening time trial of the 1969 Tour de France. Rudy set the pace from the start just under 47 kilometers per hour. The closest team was over five minutes behind, but the young German did not back off for a second. After 70 kilometers, Jacques couldn't take it anymore. It took all his enormous talent just to hold Rudy's wheel. 40 kilometers, almost an hour of purgatory remained. For 20 kilometers, Rudy continued at his infernal pace. Then suddenly, he sends Jacques slipping out of his draft. Altic pulled to the side, let Jacques ride past, and then Rudy sprinted up to Jacques, pushed him back up to speed, all of this in a 52-13, before resuming his place at the front all the while shouting encouragement. The more Altic sensed that victory might be lost, the more crazed he became. He pushed Ankatil dozens of times. It was truly superhuman. Ankatil never dreamed of quitting. I was in a fog, he admitted later. I could only distinguish vague forms. All I cared about was getting the maximum protection on Altic's wheel. At the entrance of the velodrome for the finish, it was necessary to enter the track through a tunnel under the stands and then onto the track. Jacques never made the turn. He plowed straight into a telephone pole. Fortunately, the times were taken at the track entrance. The watch showed that Altic Ankitil had won comfortably. But what Jacques won that day, not to mention his fans and adversaries, was an appreciation of his full capabilities. In all, Ankitil won an impressive 200 road races during his career. Ankitu claimed that his sole aim was to make money in cycling and he chose his targets carefully to maximize his value. They were paid differently depending on which races they showed up for. During the height of his career, the French public viewed him as an emotionless machine and often sided with his beaten rivals such as Raymond Polydor, who was nicknamed the Eternal Second. His popularity wasn't what it should have been because the French public found, found him to be too distant. It was thought that most of his wins were the result of his time trialing expertise and not necessarily by grit and determination. It was not until that mountainous tour when he challenged the eagle of Toledo that he began to see the other side of Jacques, also known as Anc. Anquetil was also known as a partier a partier and a consumer of fine wines and fine food, foods, as the next story illustrates. Supposedly, between two races, Ankitil stayed up all night playing cards, drinking, ended up going to bed like three in the morning for a race that was supposed to start at eight. And when his manager went to wake him up, he told him to leave him alone. And his manager got him up. He ended up dragging himself to start the race and actually ended up winning the race. And when his manager expected a thank you, all he told his manager was keep the champagne on ice when they were on the podium. And that was Rafael Geminiani. So at the age of 35, in 1969, Ankitil retired after 19 years as a professional. And he died from stomach cancer on November 18, 1987, aged 53.
Jacques Anquetil was a special writer. I mean, he, uh, his style has been copied for decades. Everybody wanted to be like him. He was smooth, you know, just he pedaled effortlessly on the bike. And uh, there's so much to his life, I could not cover it in even a two-hour video. So uh, I will put some links to some of the books that I read and some of the articles in the description. So for those of you who want to go deeper, I will also put the link to the blog that I wrote about Jacques that has more detail on there. Uh, but he was a special writer, one of, his, one of a kind. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And no matter what, don't let anything stop you. Get out there and get your miles. <laughs>